My name uh, is uh, Sergei Koksenko. I'm working at Oracle, and my job, my goal is making Java faster in whatever it does it means. Uh, that slide I just showed for you, it's probably the most important slide in that presentation. It's uh, literally, that slide literally told you that I may say anything, whatever came to my mind, and it means any consequences for me. Okay, so that's short about me. I want to make a short survey, I'm doing that survey on every presentation because of I really need to get feedback from the audience. First of all, who uh, are here is using Java? Cool, exactly, what I'm expecting. So right now, I will start uh, naming Java versions. And please raise your right hand if you are using that version in production. And left hand if you are using that Java version for your toy projects or for just build for something internal but not in production. Of course, you may raise both hands. So start from the fresh one. 13. 12. 11. 10. 9. 8. Oh. <laughs> Seven, six, five. Oh, it's not a zero. That's awful. Okay, I uh, let's talk about a little bit of scalability. It's very known and typical scenario. I added some physical resources to my machine, and my program, my application, doesn't work faster. What what happened? how to improve it. I, I bought a new laptop, new Mac Pro, whatever, it, it doesn't work. What will you do? What, what's the first step from your idea? Go, go, go got a bunch of liquid uh, nitrogen and try to cool you down your hardware? Maybe, whatever. I uh, just started saying that people are very frequently starting looking for log profiler, thread profiler, your kit, mission control, whatever. But uh, in my opinion, certainly it's the second step. First step, you have to understand why uh, your application is not scalable. What prevents your system to work faster? And that is I'm going to talk about. Here, I'm not able to cover the all aspects of that why question for such limited of time just only some of them, and of course I won't be able to cover any kind of tools, profilers, whatever, uh, which are typically using for logging and all other issues. Uh, a little bit uh, introduction. So why we need a concurrency? Concurrency is a question is only about performance. If our sequential program will, will work faster than our concurrent program, we will use sequential, we will write sequential, whatever. And uh, in general, uh, there are three different goals for using concurrency for dif different performance metrics dealing with concurrency, concurrency and parallel applications. And the goal how we achieve uh, scalability in all cases a little bit different. First of all, most extreme cases to reduce latency of our application. Somehow we have to parallelize each task if it's small task we, we, we could do a lot of efforts. The, uh, the, the second step, a little bit easy, just to hide latency. We don't uh, split our task, all different subtasks, etc. But we execute in parallel something else, so pretending that the system is working and the user is happy. And the third way, most frequent uh, case when we are talking about scalability, it's increased throughput. We just able to pass much more requests and whatever. What is scalability? Scalability is a simple idea. We are adding some resource, we're adding physical resource and checking how our performance is changing. Here I will uh, limit myself only but, uh, by, by things which are called typically vertical scalability, adding new CPU, adding new cores, having multi-cores machines. 
Okay, a little bit generalization. So we have large space of resources, it's n dimensional. Performance is just a function of each point of that space. And scalability is a derivative of that resource. It's, it's gradient and uh, we are moving through the field to find a better performance. So if you are standing at some point, uh, maybe it's better not to invent the bicycle, ju ju just to add some resources to check how that vector supply in different directions and start adding that resource which show us the better, the better uh, uh, benefits. There are several strategies how to understand uh, what resource is uh, really needed to be added to improve our performance, which is most limited. The most frequent but not useless strategy is just guess and check. Just add it and check your performance. Like, I have a machine, what I can, there is a free CPU slot there, I could install new CPU socket and check a performance. It's sometimes it's quite easy to dig in through a lot of logs and uh, an analysis and work with that. Uh, better strategy when we are trying to understand which resource is not sufficient for our performance. And here there are two key questions. Did you find that resource properly? We made, made some mistakes in our assumptions. And even if you added that resource, uh, if our program can use it. Just for example, like I executed some my application on a single core machine. Okay, it's not easy that days I go into museum, find all machine, executed it on a single core machine, got a performance, found that CPU is the most limited resource, 100% utilization, I have not enough CPU. I run it at multi-core machine, but nothing happened because my application is just single threaded and whatever. Uh, to understand uh, the utilization of resource, the most typical way is looking for uh, utilization of that resource. And, and there is a big pitfall, pitfall here because of uh, if you are looking into basic charts, basic monitors, we, are, we can see 100% CPU utilization. Unfortunately, we have to look uh, deeper and understand different parts of our CPU because of 100% CPU, uh, CPU utilization doesn't tell us what happened inside our CPU. It could be very different problems. And a little bit, a last uh, short set about theory. There are two bad laws related to scalability. First of all, it's Amdahl law. Uh, I, I won't describe it uh, in large details, but if we have some alpha, it's a serial part of our work. So this chart is showing how the performance scales with increasing amount of our parallel rocks, cores, whatever. It's a really proven theoretical law. You can bypass it. It's obvious, it's easy, very, very easy to prove. But uh, in general, people realize that uh, Amdahl's law does not correlate with uh, real program executions. And there is another law which called universal scalability law. It's like, it's the same as Amdahl law when our beta is interaction between different thread, between different parallel processes. Uh, zero, we got an Amdahl law. But it's, uh, if it's not a zero, it implies different behavior, different characterization. There is a green line on the chart which showing that. And uh, people found, it was checked, that very many, not all, but many applications really behave with uh, universal scalability law in real life. And even uh, the application of universal scalability law is significantly extreme is, for example, capacity planning. People just do uh, perform some measurement on a curve with different amount parallelization and they extrapolate that uh, universal scalability law to understand how it will scale in the future and do some assumptions. And unfortunately, there are two consequences of the laws. Because of Amdahl law say, says us that it's always there is a limit in our scalability. There is a point you, you can never can reach. 
and uh, universal scalability law uh, tell us that uh, there is a maximum. Scaling after the maximum point, you will get slowed down in your performance. You will get regressions. Sometimes maybe you just make a stop and understand that you achieved the optimal point and don't go before. If uh, we are working with uh, uh, scalability, we frequently think in software terms. We are using threads, we are using actors, whatever. But software is an abstraction, work done by hardware. And relation between our components, software components and hardware cores is quite important. And very, the most first step of understanding is it's how your amount of working thread, not all thread, but working threads, it's related to amount of cores which you have. It's obvious that if uh, you have no job, your, your core is idling and wasting hardware resources. If uh, threads is much more than cores, threads became competing for your hardware. It was uh, for many years, uh, it was idea discussed for concurrency that ideally, f the most ideal architecture for scaling, for scalability, for concurrency, so-called thread per core, TPC architecture. Unfortunately, I never saw a really successful uh, done system. A lot of people trying, and probably something will, will get in the future in that area. Uh, the case when uh, our thread less than core, why we can get it? We just, our application has not enough parallelism. I can help to pinpoint you in that situation. You have to know your application and deal down. Very frequently we are using third party libraries, frameworks, whatever, that libraries, frameworks has thread pools inside and you don't have a control over that thread pools. It's a bad. The other case, People frequently are making the system uh, underutilized just to improve latency. It's a deliberate choice and it makes sense for some cases. And sometimes we just execute it and we don't understand the, the, our hardware properly. We thought it was eight cores, but it was 64, et cetera, et cetera. A little bit short uh, comment about a case when you intentionally trying to improve latency not uh, fully <coughs> utilizing your system. Uh, modern CPU, all kind of, they have so-called C states. And core in C state, C state C0, C0 is working. All other states, core is not working. Then larger numbers, then less parts of core is working. It's done for saving powers. And there is automatic switching inside CPU for that. It's not the whole CPU which could be idle, it could be some different course even on the same package, on the same chip. The problem with that is that uh, waking up the physical core from that uh, state is a very cost operation. And it makes take a lot amount of time to raise your core when we got a situation you need to deal with spike and check with latency. Just, just if you want to go in that situation, just turn off all the state as possible on hardware level. I've got a very funny example, one of my colleagues several years ago, he wrote a very simple program on C, not Java. It was a proxy. That proxy program was getting requests and sending it another. For some internal use, just, it, it should be very reliable, whatever. And it was working for some time. At some day, he realized that he executed a debug version of that program, just, just by mistake. Okay, he compiled it with release version, eliminate all asserts, all debug logging, and executed it. And throughput falls three times. Just because of new version, became faster. New version of application was able to get all, get all messages, send it, and started waiting. And CPU were going to idle C state. Debug version was slow and it was constantly sending message and CPU wasn't falling to C state. It's a dangerous place. The other situation, the amount of thread 
larger than cores. Again, we may get the situation when we don't have control over thread pool. We, uh, we are doing it again intentionally. If we have a lot of waiting stress and trying to fill our gaps, and again, we could uh, detect our CPU incorrectly. Uh, just uh, a little bit check. It's a 64 sky lake. I'm executing very simple application, just showing what could happen. It's 64 cores, and I see that throughput is not significantly changed in that situation. People may think that it's a fine picture. But if you'll change to average time of my request, it's a total throughput of the system. Uh, the time is going up. And if we are checking, for example, 19% of the latency situation became, became much worse. And 99% again, much, much worse. Just check it uh, milliseconds time. So it really is the idea to running a lot of threads just in case doesn't make sense. How to check how to check the behavior of a situation where we have a lot of running threads? I am limited limit my details about Linux systems. If you are working with something else, you easily could find similar tools. What you need uh, just just using VM start and looking into our column is amount of running processes which which should be executed and. Uh, column and system in its, its involuntary context features, which also could be important and show, show us the cost and overhead we, which we're getting here for scalability. Okay, incorrect hardware detection. Very frequent situation, especially right now, everybody using some kind of clouds, Kubernetes, whatever. And it's just a screenshot from Stack Overflow when we didn't get information on something like that. It was a lot of discussion some time ago. Another issue which uh, raising here, uh, the one strategy to improve performance and scalability of Java, it's uh, execute multi-VM configuration. If my application allows me to have several uh, GVM running on the same machine, I could do it. I must uh, do affinity of that machines to different cores, for example. But what it means? If I am doing multi-VM configuration by myself, I have to tweak all uh, concurrent settings of uh, GVM, which usually done internally by some economics tweaks, which you should know or you don't want to know. At the example, at least four parameters, you have to understand how to tweak it. Moreover, we have a runtime available processor invocation, which hardly did all Java Util concurrency package depends on it. And even some, some things is new API also depends on right detection of mount CPU which we are using. And honestly, it may produce bad results when we incorrectly detect the amount of our course. I have to say that it's fixed. Since Java 10, we did a properly detection of CPU in uh, Docker containers, uh, other, not only CPU, but in memory also, but I will talk about CPU here. And moreover, uh, affinity with task set, like running manual multi-GVM multi -GVM configuration, also is fixed. It's just a simple, quite simple program which shows us the amount of available processors and how it works on Java 9 and Java 13. It shows us exact number of CPU which we have. And in that case, GVM is doing proper adjustment of GVM internal threads. So if you have a scalability issue related similar to that, I'd suggest to you to move something later than Java 10 or Java 10, but not before some migration. Uh, there is a request for backporting that feature to Java 9 and Java 8, but I'm sorry, I just don't know the status. Maybe it's already done, maybe it will be done somewhere in future, and new releases will be done with that. Okay, of course you could turn off that feature, and even you could play with the active processor count by yourself, as you wish. What's required? 
And the key, the key point when we are doing with scalability situation is to understand what's causing scalability, why. I mean, did we have uh, some resource contention? Did we have some problems with hardware resources? Or it's our application synchronization inside our application which doesn't work. There is a hint, very easy hint how to check it. it. It doesn't work in all cases, but if you're able to split your application by two GVM with a half amount of threads, and your cumulative throughputs of two executions is larger than throughput than you have in a single execution, it means that you have a software problems. It doesn't mean you don't have a hardware problems, but it means that you have a software problems with logs because of two different GVM doesn't intersect, doesn't interfere into it, each other except of hardware. And it um, easily understand uh, where to start digging in the first step. Uh, a little bit talk about hardware. I will mostly talk about hardware in that presentation because of people more People frequently using for logging, threading, barriers, whatever, but they don't care about hardware. And from my point of view, it's a very large mistake. The general uh, issues with uh, scalability on hardware could be split in two categories. When just different parallel workers started to use in some shared resource, there are a lot of different such resources, and just not enough capacity of that resource to to, to work properly with scaling. And in other case, it's a logic of that hardware resource, like cache coherency, which may induce a very large slowdowns. As I told, we have a lot of problems with CPU utilization. It's not clear how to understand and how divided on different issues. Okay. And uh, the other situation uh, which I want to raise, people when saying about scalability, they frequently thinking about this amount of cores. It's just a simple table. I had one socket in my hardware and installed second socket. And how much hardware threads and cores I've got. But it looks like from that table, CPU is not really the most limiting resource here. Just, just by size. Uh, the first uh, hardware problem which I want to, to tell, it's, it's a hyper-threading, as it's called by Intel, and simultaneous multi-threading for other hardware vendors. And it's the idea that we don't create a proper core. We just uh, using the, the core completely by two hardware threads, and only a small amount of hardware resources are separated, just dedicated like some registers, whatever. Uh, it's a not a real core. It, it, it's really not a core. It's never intended for scalability, and it may give you slowdowns. Intel has uh, hyper-threading for years, years, years. AMD uh, did not have uh, hyper-threading before. Right now, they've got it in Zen architecture. But in bulldozer architecture, it was much, much more funny. They claim they had a real core, but the floating point uh, unit also was sharded between two cores, and that sharding may cause problems with scalability. Uh, and the issue with hyper-threading is the strategy when you don't need to understand, don't need to analyze uh, with some monitors, did you stuck with that issue in it? It's the, it, it's the place where the best strategy is just to check, turn it on, turn it off, run it, and compare results. Uh, the other resource which frequently have a problems for our scalability is CPU caches, which costs a lot. And you, you, you may don't think how to detect it. I, I, I assure you, your application is suffer from not sufficient CPU cache size. It's obvious. I just want to say it. Here, working with caches, you, you need to understand what is working size of your working application. There are some profilers, monitor tools, which show you your working size. It's not well. On Linux, it's quite clear to do it by such tricks. Just you need only console, and you, you could understand the working set of your application. And I just shown how to have impact on scalability. 
it's a sky lake, two sockets, 16 proper core. In, in general, this happy threading in that system have, uh, has uh, 64 cores, and I'm running different, different applications. This application is a small working set, 10 kilobytes per each thread. It scales perfectly thin uh, 32 cores, and when we start increasing to 64, operating system is quite smart. Operating system does not uh, assign your threads into hyper threads if it's possible to put it on different cores. So we start putting it into hyper thread cores and we don't get any performance boost and even small degradation. Just increase our working set, 32 kilobytes. It's enough for one thread to fit, to fit into L1, but when you, we are scaling till 64 cores, you are slowed down, one megabyte. Scaling became much worse, eight megabytes, and 20 megabytes, much, much worse. So you always may uh, measure your working set to understand exact hardware where, which you are using and to understand will you fit into that case or not. And in general, uh, the problems with caches, there, there is no one point in a program which may don't, you, you may fix and fix all slowdowns. The slowdowns with caches, with time access to the memory, it's dispersed through a program almost evenly in, in different places. And the, the only you can do is just to reduce it. Uh, memory. The caches, very useful when we are accessing to data, to data several times, like on that, on that chart, we are using data iteratively. If we are accessing to new memory, it can be inside a cache, and here is, we got a problem with the memory controller and memory traffic, which also limited and limits our execution much more than size and power of separate cores. There are different tools uh, for measuring speed of your memory traffic, or bandwidth of your memory traffic. I'll just uh, show you one example as, uh, which I'm using. You can find it on GitHub it, but for Intel architecture. There are similar for other, but you may don't care, don't want to dig significantly into hardware. There is a very nice uh, auxiliary matrix. It's object allocation rate inside Java machine. Object allocation rate frequently correlate with the memory traffic. Because of every new allocated object should be written, it can be in cache and should be created and it's induced traffic. It's uh, my example from my other presentation when we're dealing with uh, project Valhalla in line types. And thread one is classical reference uh, class with a very high allocation rates, rate which achieves 16 gigabytes per second. That's a physical limit on my memory controller. And green line is the case when we removed uh, object allocation, we don't have memory traffic and we're scaling pretty well in that case. Okay, cache coherency, it's a another problem. Who know what cache coherency is? Not a few. I just uh, have to say the two things. First of all, a byte is an abstraction. In hardware, there is no such thing as byte. Uh, all hardware system, they perform real reads of reads and writes from memory by some bunch of bytes, blocks, which called cache line. On Intel, it's 64 bytes. It could be, on different architecture, it could be different. And you always read that 64 bytes, and after that only before you execution, you extract that byte from that. And if you, roll, if you write uh, one byte, you insert that byte into cache line which resides in cache and write the, the full cache line. And if uh, CPU wrote cache line into memory or modified something inside that cache line, that should be changed for all CPU which we have in our system due to memory model due to our hardware memory model requirement, just to make sure that other 
uh, CPUs could see the proper updated data. And the sources of that, first of all, it's shared data. If you're using the same, the same data, which modifying data from different threads, your scalability is gone. All synchronization. Because of synchronization is shared data, if you're synchronizing the same log, you have to somehow tell the other threads that we are logging. It's better synchronization. And of course, you did nothing, but you got problems with cache coherency if you are lucky to hit into false sharing. When just you have separate objects, one object for one thread, one object for another thread, but it's a small object, and they are located inside one single cache line. And it's example of scalability. I don't know how to say it. It's probably not scalability. It's de de degradability in, in case of cache coherency. Because of one thread, we don't have any kind of false sharing. Just it's just single one call, one thread. We just execute two threads, and we're done. And if you like numbers, it's a cost of simple incremental instruction from two threads. And it's very fast when you don't have any conflicts and it became slow and slow if you put that in data for incrimination into the same cache line and it became a much worse a different different cost of that if you execute on course from the same socket or course from different socket whatever uh, how to detect it there is only way to detect it it's hardware counters Happily, such feature exists in all new modern CPUs, and I had a presentation several years ago how to deal with that. And that that that, that talk uh, contains exact uh, examples uh, that examples with for sharing, and show particular counters which I am using for detecting hardware counters. The nice the nice fact about hardware counters they. They could not only sh tell you what's the problem, but, but they, they could uh, show you the point in your program where that problem is located. It's like VTune, Oracle Studio Performance Analyzer, Perf, and some other tools like that. And probably uh, that's all I want to tell about hardware and a, li uh, a little bit about software. So the most obvious issue in software with, with, uh, with uh, scalability is logs. And logs makes your application serialized if uh, other threads can't work. Even if there is no contention on that log, particularly when thread became waiting, it in increases overhead between threads. It increases uh, coherency traffic, it's great, etc. And what to do with logs? To understand, do you really need a log? Is it too big log? In that case, you will stall uh, other threads for a very long time. If it's small log, too small log, you won't stall other threads, but you will get a too high uh, overhead for, for synchronization. Just and just an examples in how it could be done. I've got such kind of application and it's scalability with a course. It's some asynchronous HTTP2 protocol. Uh, how, how to deal it? You could use uh, any profiler which you like. Java Mission Control uh, can show you log contention. I heard that your kit could show you log contention, but my experience shows me that in uh, 80 or even 90% of cases, you don't need of any specific profiler. Just get Java logs from your application, send, send signal, you get log. You could parse that log. You, you, you need nothing except console to do it. Here you could see all states of your application and understand what I trade doing, block it or parked, or whatever. And even you could find the point where the most blocking thread is located with all the stack sizes and working. It works, of course, for low-hanging fruits, but believe me, uh, scalability issues all very frequently are low-hanging fruits. It, as such way, doesn't work in case of critical threads. The critical threads uh, is a st threads which takes a few amount of resources, not extremely 
that doing something, but that thread uh, holding a lot of logs, which uh, prevents all other threads from working. So sometimes fixing that critical threads could give you much more benefit than trying to deal with the whole system which depends on it. It's like um, I had an example, I had a thread which had a constantly waiting on I.O. and got a probably 10, 15% of utilization, but that thread receiving I.O. messages was waking uh, other threads. And just optimizing by a, a very, very small amount works like couple percent inside that thread for activity which was not inside blocks on the synchronization, but allows uh, the thread to iterate faster, it improved the performance of the whole system by probably twice. Uh, tracking. And simple, simple optimization which uh, I caught with that, I just reduced size of log. I found a critical section which is responsible, responsible for that end try to remove everything what's possible out of log to make it, to make it, to make it as shorter as possible. And anyway, uh, threads are our most important resource and very difficult to create a lot of threads. Do you know how many threads do you have in your application? Who knows? Tell me a number. 200, exactly. I had one application, uh, I've got 800 threads. I tried to get, I tried to get uh, 900 that I got out of memory. It's a very limited resource. Creation of threads is, is very expensive. And some simple example. Uh, knowing uh, where you create your thread, how many threads you create, is very, 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 very important for scalability. It's a, Example of cached thread pool. I found uh, cases when people started inserting uh, large I.O. operation inside cached thread pool, but it was not intended for that. Cached thread pool was intended for executing small, very small tasks, not, not a big task. Because of that thread has two, it has advantage and disadvantage. Advantage that everything you put into that thread will be executed immediately immediately with the cost of thread creation, but you will create a thread. It's just a simple example uh, of that large IO application with a cached thread pool, and we just fixed thread pool with two threads, which show, show me almost double performance. Uh, the, the key idea here is that, uh, as we know, using looking into universal scalability laws, there is a maximum, max value. After that, you will get degradation. Maybe sometimes it makes sense to find that max and don't start scaling. And if you have imbalanced tasks, you have a set of large, small tasks, and you have a, a set of small tasks and large tasks, particularly with blocking AO, maybe it makes sense to split into different red pools. And that large AO operation limit two, three, four, whatever, depends on logic you need, maximum you find, but it will increase overall throughput for small tasks which are not blocking and working. Uh, another quite interesting question which, which people ask about scalability, how much does it cost to start and stop thread? And I want to ask a question, do you know the difference between these two invocations? Okay, how many people know difference? One, uh, ten. It's so sad for me to hear that. I'm sorry. Uh, it's re on log from Java till concurrent. And the parameter true meets its fair log and follows mean unfair log in details. Fair log preserves the sequence of uh, threads which try to acquire that log. So if one thread is holding log and threads two, four, 17 came, when that log started release, that thread will be waked in that order. In first, how they come uh, and, and they're out. Unfair log is a cheating log. Some threads uh, which came the last one asking I need that thread, that thread could acquire that log first. And it uh, done just by thread stopping. In case of fair lock, if you have a queue of waiting threads, you are stopping each thread which came, you wake up another thread. 
and uh, assumes start and stop of such operation. Not always, but it increases the amount. Unfair lock, if there is a bunch of threads waiting for that lock, they are stopped. New threads are coming to that length, the last one, and here at that moment we are releasing the lock. That not stop thread could acquire lock and bypass all waiting and stop thread. And here is just example is different between fair and fair locks of total throughput of the system scaling with different cores. And that three times between behavior of fair and fair lock uh, explained only by cost of thread start and stop. So it's quite an expensive operation for us. We are stopping thread on blocking I.O. and we are stopping thread on all kind of synchronization issues. That is why we uh, started a new project Loom when we are adding fibers and continuation into GVM. We already got a very nice results. In case of fibers and continuations, you won't get a lot of stops. You, you shouldn't stop a thread uh, when you go to I.O. Uh, and thread is look like, uh, fiber looks like a thread. It's not a thread, but looks like a thread. You code like a thread, and you could have a million of fibers in a working system. Unfortunately, I have no time to do more detailed explanation of what Project Loom is, particularly when we get in the future. There's nice links which describe that, and soon uh, that will be done in Mailand. Thank you for coming. Probably that's all for my side. Questions? Thank you.